everyone, I'm the Blood Guy. Welcome back to another review of a serial killer documentary. Now, my last review was a Tubi original. We did just get Tubi. So I've been going through checking out all the serial killer documentaries and films that are on that. I've already went through, made a list of everything I wanted to check out. So, yes, I know what's on there. And so this will be another one. And, yes, as you can tell by the glasses and the shirt, this is yet another uh, one on Jeffrey Dahmer. It will not be the last one, though, because there are a ton of documentaries on Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, actually, it's not even the last one on Tubi to be checking out, which I think this is the only Tubi original. I think some of the other ones just happen to be on there. Now, this is one that I've heard of. Of course, I had not seen it yet. It is a one-and-done, hour-and-a-half uh, a documentary. Uh, came out in 2021. So two years ago at this point, and it's called Fresh Beat Jeffrey Dahmer. Now I, and this one is very similar to the uh, Green River one, both in how it looks, how it's presented, lots of dramatizations. It is very much a uh, main event or major event kind of a bullet point kind of presentation of the life crimes trial and death of jeffrey dahmer it does have a number of uh true crime podcasters as our talking head of interviewees but it does have a lot of people from the dahmer case as well uh, but before i get too far i probably will say right off the bat this is probably <clears throat> I, I hate to use the word worst because i i still enjoyed it i mean being a true crime enthusiast, especially serial killers, that being my biggest interest and biggest passion, I, I can watch 40 documentaries on the same killer and never get bored of it, always find something to take away from it. And even the lesser ones will still be very good and worth the time, which this one is. But I have to say, this is probably the lesser or the worst Dahmer one I've seen so far. Now again, still well worth the time checking out, but I did have a lot of problems with it. Now, it was directed by a guy named Kevin Barry. Uh, it doesn't tell me who narrates it, though I, I believe it's the same guy who did the Green River one from my last video. Uh, as far as podcasters... We have uh, two guys from uh, last podcast on the left. We, I know they have another book out, but this is the only one that uh, uh, I have. <clears throat> um, Henry Zabrowski and Ben Kissel from la last podcast on the left. Th they're sort of the hosts of the feature. Also, uh, Savannah Brimer of Killer Instinct, which I have not listened to. If I'm not mistaken, it's from Parcast, which is a sort of a podcast station, I guess, that I listen to. Uh, Serial Killers is one of my favorite podcasts. That's on Parcast. I think I've heard this advertised on Parcast. <clears throat> and a guy named uh, uh, Michael Drain from Unpopular Culture, who's also a psychotherapist. They're the ones that's really kind of taken us through the story of Dahmer really from birth all the way to death and yeah it, I, I've always said in when looking at films or documentaries of serial killers like this Dahmer Bundy Gacy Manson that have just had a slew an almost endless amount of documentaries and films on them is there something about this one is there a different angle, a different point of view, or a different way of looking at things that's going to make this stand out? And yes, this one does. Uh, this one doesn't just chronicle every major event in Dahmer's life, even though it does do that. It's trying to present Dahmer as <clears throat> the quintessential cannibalistic serial killer. Or the serial killer that has become so synonymous with cannibalism. That uh, uh, every so often they'll make a comparison and then we'll jump into a segment of another of infamous cannibalistic killer. Uh, you know, they talk about Ed Gein. Uh, 
Arbid uh, Abivis, Arbid Bivis out of Germany. Uh, Luca Magnata, who I really disagree with him being a segment on here. Uh, and a few other ones. There, there's one married couple whose name I keep forgetting, but they're in my notes. <clears throat> and kind of comparing uh, Dahmer's aspect of cannibalism and saving body parts to these other cases. And sometimes it tries to make it sound like, you know, either they're comparing them to Dahmer or trying to make it sound like, but also talking about their differences, like how they kind of deviate from the atypical psychology of a cannibalistic killer, making Dahmer sort of the king of the cannibals. But even then, it it, it does sound kind of messy. It it sounds like their hypothesis kind of gets lost in, in what they're talking about and it pops up every so often and they really build up the cannibalism in this special uh i mean for like the first hour or so however long it takes because it chronicles like the first eight or nine victims like as they happen then it'll skip a few and then it goes right into the cannibalism and after each victim it says although he's not quite you know, delved into cannibalism yet he is still on the you know having these dark fantasies and you know we'll cut to some different cannibalistic killer compare them now of course Gein does make sense uh Mivis does kind of make sense uh, 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 even the married couple out of Germany that makes sense Luca Magnata doesn't because it, it, it's really the only comparison they make to Magnata is Dahmer started out with animals and then ended up with people and then ended up doing cannibalism except Dahmer never killed an animal he found roadkill and dead animals then dissected them then started killing people doing the dissection and then way down the line ended up getting into cannibalism Whereas, uh, Magnata, me, uh, I think maybe he killed tortured animals as a kid, but the Magnata that we all know, which it talks about the internet videos that he made, you know, with the cats, talking about how he started making videos of harming cats, killing cats, and then eventually murder, and I think in the infamous um, ice pick video, it shows him taking a chunk of flesh, then eating it. I don't I don't think those are urges for Magnata. I think that's just him trying to make a shocking video for views. So I really don't think Magnata was a very good choice for this segment. I mean, they could have done uh, Chikatillo or you know, uh, so many other ones. <clears throat> but you know the the positives, the talking heads all do a good job at trying to keep you interested at telling their portions of it uh, some of the other speakers we get is <clears throat> uh, Vernell Bass husband of Pamela Bass which he was also in the Jeffrey Dahmer tapes which I was lucky enough to find a bootleg of both the Dahmer tapes and Gacy tapes it will take a while to get here because they're overseas but I'm very glad to own those that Pamela is still alive, so I'm not sure why she doesn't really, maybe she doesn't make public appearances anymore. I mean, I know she was in Jeffrey Dahmer Files, Dahmer on Dahmer, uh, Invisible Monsters. Vernell Bass, he has written a book. He was in the Dahmer tapes. He's in this. Uh, Nancy Glass of Inside Edition. She was the one that did the 1993 uh, uh, interview with Dahmer. She's one of our main speakers. Uh, Fred Berlin, who's a psychiatrist. Mike Kukrell, if you if I pronounce that correctly, a classmate of Dahmer. Uh, he's a speaker. Uh, we do get bits of Lionel and Grandma, but it's in archive footage. There there is a lot of archive footage, which I appreciate. Uh, Michael McCann, who's been in other Dahmer documentaries, he, he was the. Uh, I believe he was the prosecutor in Dahmer's trial. And now I'm... 
I've always said in a lot of these uh, Dahmer documentaries that, especially at this point, you know, because I've read so much on Dahmer, I mean, whether it be these or this or, you know, these two, which these ones I've actually read. Uh, these next two just came in this week, so I have not had a chance to read them yet. But uh, Dr. Joel Doris's book and Step Into My Parlor, I think two of the earliest books on Dumber to be published, as was Monster, originally published as The Man Who Could Not Kill Enough. So I've read a lot on Dahmer. I've seen a lot of documentaries on him that at this point, other than the main points that every single documentary makes, what is the hook, or what do I find most interesting? And as I've said in whichever the last Dahmer one I reviewed was, I believe it was the Jeffrey Dahmer Files, are people who actually knew Dahmer. And in this, it's not just a classmate, but there is a... Uh, a drag performer named, I believe it's Goldie Adams. Yes, which actually, there's a picture of him, her, uh, appears in the book by Dr. Joel Norris. <clears throat> which at first I was like, okay, is it just a drag queen talking about, you know, the, the gay community in Milwaukee at that time? No, come to find out, he, he knew Dahmer, and he talks about how Dahmer always stood off by himself. He was very shy. So he introduced himself. They kind of became friends. But also mentions how you know, a lot of the men in the gay bars were looking at this tall, white, blonde guy. Was very attracted to him. But they were too nervous to approach him. And one guy that Goldie introduced to Dahmer ended up being a victim. So... <clears throat> To me, that's the most interesting aspect of a lot of these documentaries. Because at this point, I, I, I pretty much know the story. Like, I, I know the, the story of his life and the crimes. So when you get these random sort of people that haven't appeared in other things yet, talking about their... Uh, some of their uh, appearances or... What's the word I'm looking for? Some of their back and forths with Dahmer. Uh, that I, I find to be the most interesting. Now, one thing I found really surprising about this documentary, and another thing that really breaks this down, is how much misinformation there is. Like, there's a lot it gets wrong to, like, a surprising level. Uh, a lot of it is dates. You know, some of it is kind of forgivable. Like... <clears throat> the murder of his second victim, uh, Stephen Tuomi, which, you know, that was the one at the Ambassador Hotel that he had to smuggle out in a suitcase. I've always read it as September 15th, 1987. Other places will say November 20th, 87. This says November 20th. I've always knew it as September 15th, but I know different sources say different things. I know it's probably because his body was never found and they can't exactly pinpoint it. But it goes beyond that. Like, <clears throat> the worst one is when, because of course it talks about the, um, the uh, incident with Conorak Sintosophone, excuse me, the 14-year-old, 15-year-old Laotian boy that was given back to Dahmer by the police. Which, it mentions the sexual misconduct with his brother in 1988. It mentions that. But, it mentions Conorak as being the older brother of the one that got fondled back in 1988. And, uh, when it shows the dramatization and we get the audio calls by uh, Nicole Childress, uh, uh, Glenda Cleveland's niece... Which she actually appears in this. She uses her professional name. But Nicole Childress appears in this. Which, okay. Awesome. The, uh, that and the drag queen, I say, were two of the biggest pluses uh, in this documentary. But uh, <clears throat> when we actually get the audio of the call, it says, 
like September 26, 1988. And then when we get the audio of the call to dispatch from Officer John Balserzak, it says September 26, 1988. I think that was the date that the brother got uh, molested by Dahmer because Conorak was May 27th of 91. So uh, a lot of their information is mixed up. It does mention how Dahmer moved out of Grandma's apartment in 88, or Grandma's house in 88, got an apartment. That was when he got in trouble with the uh, elder uh, Lawson brother. And then while you know he was going through trial and was being sentenced to work release, he moved back with Grandma. But with the dramatizations, it makes it look like that apartment is still Oxford because it shows the door, 213. Uh, uh, I would say the dramatizations were not very well done. Uh, <clears throat> when they're talking about Tracy Edwards, they make it sound like as soon as Edwards walked through the door, Dahmer used the handcuffs and he got freaked out and he left. When in reality, Edwards was held captive for around five hours. There's a lot of other things that it, it gets wrong. Like, I also... You know, I think it says Conorak was the first victim that he drilled uh, into his head, which is not true. He had already done it to, a, I think, three other victims. Surprisingly, you know, because once we hit, like, victim 9 or 10, that's when we stop looking at them chronologically, and it will skip a few. Surprisingly, it doesn't mention Errol Lindsay. No mention of Tony Hughes. I was really surprised by that. Especially Errol Lindsay, because... It does make a few notes of his sister, Rita Isbell, which I, I really did like the opening where it says like how cannibalism has become synonymous with one name. And then it shows the bit of Rita Isbell in court screaming, Jeffrey. So I kind of like that. Then when it shows the impact statements, it really talks about uh, uh, Rita Isbell specifically. So I'm surprised they didn't talk about Errol Lindsay. <clears throat> but yeah, for the most part, this is kind of another uh, run-of-the-mill, just, you know, from birth to death, Jeffrey Dahmer, all the main events, you know, childhood, animals, parents, divorce, high school, Stephen Hicks, Ohio, military, uh, Miami, grandmas, uh gay bars, bathhouses, getting blacklisted, uh, <clears throat> killing victims at grandma's, and then you know, moving into Oxford, Conorak, uh, and then Tracy Edwards being arrested, the new, the news media explosion, and then kind of his legacy as the most uh, notorious or infamous cannibalistic killer. Well, every once in a while, we bring up this other uh, uh, notorious cannibal case. It, it makes some uh, comparisons uh, or uh, compare and contrast with Dahmer, which that aspect is kind of interesting. But really, the thing that stood out to me most was the accounts and the recollections by the drag performer Goldie Adams and uh, Glenda Cleveland's niece uh, Nicole Childress in, in the recollections from of uh, uh, Vernell Bass as well. You know, people involved with Dahmer's life at this point. That's kind of what keeps me more interested in a lot of these documentaries. Because at this point, I pretty much know the story, but you know, I'm still going to get enjoyment out of it. I'm still going to be intrigued. <clears throat> it's just, if they didn't have stuff like that, it really would be the same information over and over and over again. But I would say because of some of the lackluster dramatizations and just the way a lot of the information was just jumbled up, like especially when they talk about like his altar a, a few different times, and then, like, the last thing they mentioned was him spray-painting skulls. But the dramatizations have pretty much had him doing that all the way back at Grandma's house. So, yeah, the, the information is kind of all over the place. It does have a lot of misinformation, a, a lot of wrong stuff. But <clears throat> So, yeah, I, I will put this at the bottom 
of the Jeffrey Dahmer uh, documentaries so far, but it's still well worth a watch. So it's on Tubi. Uh, so I guess with that, we'll get into the summary and then my hopefully not long list of things that it actually covers. Jeffrey Dahmer, a.k.a. the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster, is one of the most notorious serial killers in history. Between June 1978 and July 19, 1991, Dahmer murdered 17 young men and boys, ranging in age from 14 to 33. After being lured to his home, he would drug his victims, strangle them, take Polaroids, practice necrophilia, and then dismember them, keeping body parts around his apartment, such as skulls, whole heads, skeletons, hands, and genitalia, and even stored their meat for consumption. His crimes were a gradual progression. He didn't practice necrophilia right away, and he did not engage in cannibalism until his eighth victim, Ernest Miller, and starting with his 11th victim, Errol Lindsay, he would drill into their skulls and pour acid or hot water into their brain, hoping to render them into submissive sex zombies. Dahmer was born in Milwaukee on May 21st, 1960, to chemist Lionel Dahmer and a stay-at-home mother, Joyce. His brother David was born when Jeff was six. As a child in the Bath Township of Ohio, Jeff was known to be emotionally distant, withdrawn, and only showing interest in collecting and dissecting roadkill and other dead animals. He was a teen alcoholic shortly after realizing he was gay and having no one to talk to about it, and enduring his parents' constant fights. And he was a class clown and graduated high school in 1978. It was that summer Dahmer's parents finally divorced, and he claimed his first victim, 18-year-old Stephen Hicks, who was a hitchhiker. He then had short stints at Ohio State, the Army, and living in Miami, all cut short due to his drinking. From 1981 until 1990, Jeff lived with his grandmother, Catherine, in West Allis, Wisconsin. During this time, Dahmer worked at the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory, starting in 1985. It was, then he, he discovered the gay bars and was soon blacklisted from the gay bathhouses for drugging and leaving the men there after his assault on them. This led to him taking men to hotels, and it was at the Ambassador Hotel he killed his second victim, Stephen Tuomi, on either September 15th or November 20th, depending on the source, of 1987. This is what kicked off his official murder spree. He was arrested for numerous sex-related crimes in 1981 for drunk and disorderly conduct, 1982 for indecent exposure at a Wisconsin fair, 1986 for lewd and lascivious behavior for masturbating in the presence of two 12-year-old boys, and again in 1988 for luring a 13-year-old to pose for photographs. While living at his grandmother's, he killed three more young men. After moving into the Oxford apartments in 1990, he killed 12 more victims and began his cannibalism and making his macabre abattoir. One of his victims at this time, uh, 13-year-old Laotian boy, Conrad Sintasophone, which was on May 27, 1991, was actually the younger brother of the boy Dahmer molested in his 1988 charge. On July 22, 1991, his 2B18th victim, Tracy Edwards, escaped his apartment and flagged down police. When they got back to apartment 213, they found his, his Polaroids and a head in the refrigerator immediately arresting him. This led to a media explosion, and Dahmer became one of the most infamous killers. He was found guilty of 16 of the 17 murders and sentenced to 999 years. On November 28, 1994, Dahmer and fellow inmate Jesse Anderson were beaten to death by another inmate, Christopher Scarver. In the years since his arrest and death, there have been countless documentaries, books, films, and even a comic book made about him. Jeffrey Dahmer-related artifacts have become some of the most sought-after murderbilia. And so we'll go over what the documentary actually covers, which the intro is it goes into cannibalism and how it's become synonymous with one name. That's when we get the clip of Rita Isbell in court screaming, Jeffrey screaming at Jeff. Uh, so then we cut to Milwaukee, 1989. We're introduced to Burnell Bass. 
uh, Jeff's neighbor. Uh, talking about living in Milwaukee his whole life. We get photos of the Oxford Apartments. Uh, he talks about the Oxford Apartments, uh, how he moved in, and how he met some white guy across the hall, uh, which I thought he, I thought Dahmer moved in in 1990. Uh, and then he talks about the smell that he noticed shortly after, and then uh, his wife Pamela uh, followed it, and it went right to Jeff's door. Uh, is how Jeff said it was bad meat, and then news footage of the apartments and all the stuff getting uh, taken out. So we're introduced to uh, uh, one of our hosts, I guess, uh, uh, Henry Zabrowski of Last Podcast on the Left. On Jeff's apartment, as it was found, <clears throat> with the decomposing body next to the bed, meat inside the fridge, skulls in the separate freezer, pot of penises on the stove, uh, which I've read different lists about stuff that's uh, been found in Dahmer's apartment. Uh, and then Ben Kissel, also of Last Podcast on the Left, on uh, being 10 years old, when uh, Dahmer got arrested and how uh, he couldn't believe that humans were capable of this. Uh, also introduced to uh, Nancy Glass uh, from uh, Inside Edition on uh, when the story broke and then wanting to cover it and then a photo of their uh, 1993 uh, interview. So we cut back to 1960. Uh, we're introduced to Fred Berlin, who's a psychiatrist and expert witness for the trial, uh, how unremarkable Jeff's early life was, uh, mentions born in Milwaukee in 1960, moved to Bath, Ohio in 1968. Uh, then we get Mike Kukrell, or I'm guessing, uh, Jeff's classmate on Bath being a quiet, crimeless town, how uh, Dahmer played tennis, uh, wrote for the school paper, didn't have a lot of friends, but uh, <clears throat> so then it mentions the uh, dissecting dead animals and roadkill photo of the bath home, uh, a photo of the dog skull that Dahmer put on the stick uh, out in the woods. Uh, his parents being emotionally distant, Joyce having uh, depression and the constant fights, uh, his class clown antics such as the. Uh, of honor society photo and it being blacked out uh, which it shows uh, where was I <clears throat> uh, realizing he was gay in his teens and then mentions the boy that he had c kind of a physical fling with uh, around that age uh, which it, I'm guessing is the one from the treehouse that Dahmer talked about and other things because I've never heard of some other one. Uh, and how he had to keep keep it a secret due to the intolerance and not being allowed to talk about that sort of thing. Uh, his alcoholism as a teen. Lionel and Joyce's divorce his senior year. Lots of family and school photos uh, during this segment. And how he was left alone. Uh, how he was left alone in the house um, after the divorce. Where Introduced to uh, Michael Drain of Unpopular Culture, who's also a psychotherapist, on just feelings of loneliness and isolation and not knowing how to fill that void. <clears throat> so we jump to 1978. Uh, it goes into his obsession with this jogger. Of course, what came of that, which is finally got up the nerve to attack him, but the jogger never showed up. Uh, then he sees a hitchhiker, and it goes into how Jeff met 19 year old Stephen Hicks, uh, the, uh, um, how we took him home, they drank, and then when his advance was rebuffed, Hicks tried to leave, Dahmer panicked, and beat him to death with a barbell. Uh, someone did this said it was a moment of passion. I always remember Dahmer saying that it was a, a moment of panic. Uh, how he became aroused by the corpse and he masturbated onto it. And this being when he realized he was turned on by dead bodies or people being still and lifeless. Uh, submissive bodies. Uh, drained on how the 
<clears throat> how the high he was chasing was achieved and it outweighed his conscience. Uh, then into how he dismembered the corpse, uh, drained on his willingness to do this it can be a sign of a psychopath, his, his disconnect with humanity and empathy, uh, which... Dahmer later said that he wanted them to be asleep so that they wouldn't feel anything. Uh, so he must have felt some sort of uh, 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 remorse. So I don't think he's a textbook uh, psychopath. And so that's when it goes into uh, Luca Magnata, the, the butcher of Montreal. It makes the comparison to Magnata, the evolution from animals to humans, though Jeff admitted to never killing animals just finding dead ones, and Magnata killed animals for attention and clicks. Photos of Magnata, brief clips of his first cat video, uh, the one with the vacuum, and then eventually, or it talks about how eventually on May 25th, 2011, he uploaded the 11-minute uh, ice pick video where <clears throat> he stabs a man to death with it, cuts off the flesh and eats it, Drain compares the escalation to drug addiction and then how he sent remains to heads of uh, Canadian political parties. This is uh, uh, Magnata that did that. Which uh, Drain also on some killers like, like Magnata want to get caught for fame, which I've always read that that's just a myth. Uh, killers in general don't want to be caught. Uh, his arrest six days later at a cafe. It shows the security footage, uh, footage of his arrest, and how his victim was actually his lover, Jun Lin, who is a twenty-one-year-old. But then it ends that segment by saying, "But but Dauber wants to avoid the. Uh, he wants to avoid the attention. Like well, yeah. <clears throat> so then it goes into his pullover by the police." With Steven's body in garbage bags and then how they let him go. And then how he ended up going home, pounding the bones into dust. <clears throat> uh, the possibility of his mental state and desires being a defect from birth. How Joyce was taking 27 pills a day while she was pregnant with him. Such as growth hormones, estrogen, uh, depression meds, and uppers. Him flunking out of Ohio State due to alcohol. Brief time in, in the military, being a combat medic. Then, of course, alcohol, getting him discharged from there as well. It does show his military photo, which I don't think I've seen prior to this. So that was kind of cool. Uh, <clears throat> so we go to December of 81. He moves to West Allis, Wisconsin to live with his grandma, 77-year-old uh, Catherine Dahmer. It shows a home video of her and home video of the Dahmers all hanging out. Uh, talks about him getting into a, a, a religion and then delving very deeply into it, hoping it would fix him. Because at that time, being gay, he thought was the only thing that like needed to be fixed. I guess he thought he had controlled the uh, uh, darker urges, or at least that's what uh, this made it sound like. Uh, <clears throat> then it, it how alcohol made those uh, uh desires worse then it tells the mannequin story uh Dre talks about pig malionism if i pronounce that correctly pigma leonism which is falling in love with one's own creation possibly what dauber was going through how grandma made him get rid of the mannequin which each telling of the mannequin story is it's always different in everything i see Grandma found it, threw it away. Grandma found it, made him get rid of it. Uh, grandma found it, called Lionel, made him get rid of it. Uh, his dad found it, then they went to go return it together. So uh, almost every telling of the mannequin story uh, has been different. Goes into his earlier uh, uh, sex-related crimes, such as exposing himself and uh, masturbating at a fair, exposing himself to two boys at a park, it shows his 1982 mugshot, uh, him getting a job at Ambrosia Chocolate Factory, January of 85. 
how Dahmer wanted to dig up the body of a young man who died in a motorcycle accident after seeing his obituary, but the ground was too hard, so we couldn't. <clears throat> is, so this is where we're introduced to Goldie Adams, who was a Milwaukee drag performer on the thriving, thriving, <clears throat> thriving gay community um, uh, um, at that time. Also about uh, how Jeff was noticed in the bars by men who wanted to talk to him and how he himself did a few times. Uh, he seemed nice and harmless. Uh, he goes into his... A, a reputation at the bathhouses how he was seen as a creep and they all knew that he would drug men and then just leave them to be found uh, but how he really liked bathhouses because they were secret you could go there with nobody knowing who you were <clears throat> uh, so that uh, it, yeah uh, people went anonymously, uh, and so th they couldn't tell people what happened, which the way that was explained was kind of new, talking about how, you know, a lot of people that went to the bathhouses were uh, a lot of closeted gay men that actually had wives and kids and families, and so they couldn't tell people that they were drugged and sexually assaulted at a bathhouse because that would mess their personal life up. So that's kind of how Dahmer was able to, <clears throat> he was blacklisted, but he was able to avoid, uh, you know, uh, law enforcement. Uh, so how we got blacklisted, how this led him to take him into hotels to drug them. And, uh, you know, he, he needs them unconscious, unconscious so he could have full control. Mentions how some cannib cannibals prefer their prey awake. Which leads to um, Armin Mivis, the Rottenberg cannibal. How in 2001, at the age of 40, he posted an ad online looking for someone that's willing to be eaten. And oddly enough, he does get a response from a guy named Bern Brandes. How he went to uh, Mivis' home. They drank, uh, got drunk together. It, uh, Mivis severed Brandis's penis, cooked it, they ate it together. He placed him in a bathtub, drained his blood, and then over 10 months ate about 50 pounds of uh, Brandis. And it was then, <clears throat> which uh, it does show photos of the two men and his home. Which So then it goes into the debate of is it really murder since the guy was willing to let him do it? Uh, it was consensual on both sides. And then how he was arrested when he attempted to find another victim online. And, you know, the the post was traced back to him. It, and then it shows uh, footage of him in court. Uh, so then it goes into the murder of Stephen Twilby at the Ambassador Hotel. It says eight years after his first kill... It, in November of 1987, but it was nine years because it did say 1978 was Stephen Hicks. So that's another thing it got wrong was it said eight years. But yeah, it, it says November of 87. I've always read September 15th of 87, but I do know that other places do say November 20th. So uh, I guess that's kind of one that I have to give it. Uh <clears throat> Um, everything leading up to having uh, only the skull left, you know, drugged him, he, he woke up, saw that he was dead, went out, bought a suitcase, uh, smuggled them out in the suitcase, brought him to grandmother's house, and they completely uh, dismembered him, threw everything but the skull away. <clears throat> uh, what he did with it, which... Uh, I think he said he masturbated with that as well, and then he pulverized that as well. He goes into 14-year-old Jamie Doxtater two months later, uh, which he was offered money to go back to grandma's with him. Then he was strangled, dismembered, kept the skull. Three months after that, Richard Guerrero was killed. And then it says this was the first one he practiced necrophilia with, which then it goes into necrophilia a bit. 
uh, the attempt on Ronald Flowers, which was April 23rd uh, of 88. His car would start, so Jeff offered him, you know, come back to, uh, come back to my place. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'll, I'll get some jumper cables. But they go back to Grandma's. He drugs him. But then Grandma comes downstairs, which... <clears throat> it, uh, I did put flowers is featured in the uh, uh, Mind of a Monster uh, episode on Dahmer. Uh, and how <clears throat> Grandma sat with him, and then they dropped... How Dahmer dropped him off at the hospital, and then he went... He went to uh, police, but Jeff was able to talk his way out of it. Now, I've also read that Dahmer said that he didn't kill Flowers because uh, Dauber thought he was too heavy, too big and heavy to move around after he was killed. So, according to other things I've read, it wasn't because Grandma came down the stairs, but... <clears throat> uh, so then, uh, Jeff moving into his first apartment in uh, 1990, which his first actual apartment on his own was 1988, uh, his arrest for luring and assaulting a 13-year-old boy, getting work release, and before his sentencing, he lured and killed um, Anthony Sears, March 25th of 89, which it says he took Sears home, which uh, would have been his apartment, but he was back living at Grandma's at this time. Again, moved out of Grandma's into a smaller apartment, sort of a forgotten apartment. He he lured the 13-year-old. 13-year-old got away. Uh, he got arrested for that. And then uh, during the trial and in between sentencing, he moved back in with Grandma. While he was awaiting sentencing, that's when he killed Anthony Sears back at Grandma's. Again, the dramatization makes it look like it was at his apartment and that the apartment was Oxford, but it wasn't. Uh, how now... Necrophilia wasn't enough, so he takes Sears' head to work with him. Uh, while in prison, he fantasizes about cannibalism. It goes into how cannibalism is the ultimate control, and the person will feel, now they can never leave me. They'll always be with or a part of me. Uh, says he, he likes to dine alone, but some cannibals like to share, which leads into uh, 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 Dimitri and Natalia. Bakshivi. They were the ones whose name I could ever remember. The Krasnodar cannibals. This was actually the first time that I had heard of them. Supposedly killed 30 people over 18 years, kept their meat in jars, uh, kept it in the fridge, and even uh, served a head as a holiday dinner. Though investigators do dispute a lot of this, or at the very least, the, uh, the amount of people that they killed. <clears throat> and how they would have guests over. They'd serve them human meat. It shows photos of them. But how one day neighbor Alina Bash Bashushiva, if I pronounced that correctly, was invited over, killed. Uh, Dimitri lost his phone. Someone found it. They found a bunch of photos of her being dismembered. Which it shows the photo of her head, which I was surprised by. Then how the person gave it to police, they tracked him down, and they were arrested. Uh, it goes on how cannibals are usually selfish, but they like to share and give to people, uh, which uh, Fritz Harmon and Joe Bethany would also do that. Uh, <clears throat> it says he's released on parole in 1990, which now he moves into Oxford. Uh, Vernal Bass, uh, again, who's his neighbor, and now it says author from across the hall, which you know I would love to get his book. It talks about Jeff's loneliness, Jeff working third shift, so he didn't really get to see him that much. How he always had a padlock on his bedroom door and a security camera in the living room. It shows photos of both. Uh, <clears throat> it goes into the murder of 33-year-old Raymond Smith, which now is... His uh, fantasy or ritual has escalated to taking Polaroids. 
Uh, he's now killed eight people, no cannibalism yet. It goes into the attitude of police at that time, mostly due to race and orientation. Uh, Goldie on introducing 27-year-old uh, Edward Smith to Jeff. How they hug out a few weeks and then uh, no one saw Eddie again. Uh, but his family was looking for him and it was known that Jeff was the last one to see him. Uh, but nothing came of it. Goes into how he baked and dried of Eddie's skull then smashed it. Mentions how he did feel... Uh, uh, it, it, it says how, according to Jeff, that was the most remorse that he had for any of his kills. And the reason why he did that was because word got out that he had been the last one uh, to be seen with Smith. So he goes into the murder of Ernest Miller, his eighth victim. First one to be cannibalized. Uh, it says 1991 in the narration, but it was September 2nd of 1990 when uh, Ernest Miller was killed. And it doesn't mention how he was one of the very few to have his throat slit either. Uh, <clears throat> then it goes into the difference between uh, vorophilia, if I pronounce that correctly, and cannibalism, which is uh, uh, vorophilia, is specifically fantasy. You have this arousing fantasy of cannibalism, but you have no intention of crossing over to actually doing it. <clears throat> uh, so we go back to Vernell Bass on seeing a tall black guy in Jeff's apartment one night with the door open and thinking that he found a friend. It turned out to be his ninth victim, David Thomas. Uh, it goes into how he didn't save any part of David Thomas. He just bagged and discarded him out in the town somewhere. <clears throat> it says he's not the only murderer to go down this path, which leads into Ed Gein, Butcher Plainfield. Uh, says he started collecting body parts at 41, including his mother's skin to wear, which is not true. He tried to dig up his mother, but he was unable to get to her, so he never wore uh, his mother's skin. And uh, at one point, the, voice, vo the narrator says Plainville instead of Plainfield. Uh, how he was arrested in November of 57 after the disappearance of a hardware store owner and how they find her. It goes into some of the body, how body parts of 15 women were found uh, at his farm with photos and footage of, of him. He stole from nine graves and he had two victims. So they actually found uh, 11 Parts to 11 different bodies, not 15. Uh, their similarity being the curiosity of the human body and the um, abattoir that they lived in. Uh, Vernell recalling a time he came home and heard power tools coming from 213 and Jeff yelling, uh, see what you made me do. Spring of 91, how people were looking for victims Cops nowhere to be seen, Jeff becoming more erratic, getting kicked out of bars, and now going to malls and streets to lure people. Tells the story of 14-year-old uh, Connor X and toss a phone. <clears throat> uh, how he was propositioned for photos. This is what it says he's the older brother of the one he touched in 1988. He's actually the younger brother. Uh, but uh, after he was drugged and raped, uh, this is when Dahmer attempts to make his zombie by experimenting for the first time. I believe he was the third victim. He tried drilling uh, through the skull into the brain and pouring acid or hot water and to make them a submissive sex zombie. I think Conrad was the third one he did that to. I think Errol Lindsay was the first one that he did that to. Uh, <clears throat> which... It... Also, it doesn't mention Tony Hughes, who was killed just three days prior to Conorak. So they're introduced to Cola Styles, who's the uh, some sort of professional name of Nicole Childress, the niece of Glenda Cleveland. Uh, she talks about seeing this young boy, barely clothed, uh, which... 
she doesn't even mention that she was with her cousin, Glenda's daughter, uh, Sasha Smith. But the dramatization shows her with people. Sandra Smith, not Sasha. <clears throat> so we get audio of the police call, but again, as I said earlier, it says September 26th of 88. Conorak was May 27th of 91. How Dahmer showed up to take him. It goes into their back and forth. Uh, it, it, how police handled it. Their negligence. And then we get the dispatch audio, which again, it says November 26th of 88. Uh, talked about how Dahmer drilled the second hole into his head, uh, uh, this time killing him, making him victim number 13. Uh, also at this point, it mentions the level of his cannibalism, uh, but how he had several prepared meals. Uh, with the supposed photo, it looked unlike any photos that I've seen. Uh, boiled a bunch of penises, which Dahmer admitted... To eating about 10 to 12 pounds worth of human meat throughout you know when he first started cannibalism up until he got arrested uh <clears throat> so you know he wasn't chainsaw massacre he didn't have meat hanging everywhere to eat uh vernell on the smell jeff being warned twice how he got fired for sleeping at work which i always read that it was because he called out too many times and the last time he called out so he could uh dispose of this one body so <clears throat> yeah talked about how he got fired from ambrosia chocolate factory mentions his shrine uh that he tried to make uh voiceover says by may of 91 he's killed 17 young men and boys but by the end of may 91 he's only killed 13 uh, July 22nd, 91, it goes into the escape of Tracy Edwards with interview footage of Edwards. Uh, and again, they, they make it seem like he walked through the door, Dahmer put the cuffs on him, that's when he tried to escape, but when in reality he was there for like five hours. Uh, and so that was when he was able to get out, flag down police, they came back. And when the police, Dahmer let the police in, and then they see all his Polaroids on the wall. And that was when they realized, you know, they got some sick killer. And then that was when they arrested him. I always read and always thought that, you know, the officer went in the drawer to get the handcuff key, found the photos. But <clears throat> uh, footage of the hallways and things being taken out. Vernell uh, being told uh, what was going on and his reaction. Uh, how the smell left with the boxes uh briefly mentions the reaction in uh that area also his confession uh though they found parts to 11 bodies he admitted to all 17 skips right to the trial january 92 15 counts of first degree urged to plead insanity uh footage of the trial uh shows edwards on the stand Michael McCann, the prosecutor, uh, he talks about insanity. You know, he's actually been in this documentary for quite a bit. For some reason, I just haven't put him. But yeah, he, he's actually one of the main speakers as well. <clears throat> uh, he goes on uh, insanity by law, which uh, shows up close reactions of families as he's found guilty of first degree. Uh, It, then it goes into the uh, uh, impact statements. Of course, uh, Rita Isbell being last. Uh, Nancy Glass on her 1993 interview with Jeff, even though there's no footage of it. Uh, it goes into his murder at the hands of Christopher Scarver, November 28th of 94. And a bit of his dark... Uh, uh, it ends with a little bit on his dark legacy of unfathomable crimes. The... His uh, legacy in serial killer culture, I guess. <clears throat> and so that is Fresh Meat, Jeffrey Dahmer. Again, I'd probably say this is the lesser or so far the worst of the Jeffrey Dahmer documentary series I've had. Uh, it does have a lot of information that 
it kind of conflicts with other things I've read in other places. A lot of things, it just gets flat out wrong. Uh, I, I probably would have picked a few other cannibalistic killers to make these comparisons with. That would have made more sense. But I thought the talking head uh, of interviewees did fine. They were able to keep it interesting. I really didn't care for any of the dramatizations. Uh, the people I found most interesting would have been uh, Nicole Childress, uh, uh, Goldie Adams, and I, I'd say uh, Vernell Bass as well. People that actually knew Dahmer because, again, this is about as a, a bullet point as you can get. Like, this is literally every main event of Dahmer story. And a lot of it sounds like they're kind of going by the Netflix series. <laughs> You know, those came out before. But yeah, this is definitely my least favorite so far. <clears throat> uh, uh, I was able to stay hooked, stay interested, but uh, I I was surprised by a lot of the incorrect uh, information. But yeah, th there's a few more on Dauber that I'll be checking out. And again, with how, how much I love watching serial killer documentaries, uh, I still found it interesting I still got enjoyment out of it. <clears throat> but it, if it wasn't for a few of those speakers sharing their stories or the aspect of comparing him to other cannibals, uh, I would almost say it's kind of pointless because it is just saying everything that, you can, that you've already heard in other things. Other than them, it doesn't really offer anything new. Other than getting a lot of information wrong. So that's Fresh Meat, Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, there's at least one more on Tubi that I'll be checking out uh, on top of a bunch of other documentaries. So stay tuned for those and uh, thank you for watching.